welcome, welcome, welcome to another issue of Health Issues 2010. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, here with you today. We're so excited about this particular show. It's dealing with an issue that's so major for the citizens of New Orleans and the, the business community, the medical community. It kind of touches a little bit of everything. We're here talking about today the new LSU Hospital, uh, LSU, VA, that conglomeration. Just looking at the plan that's going forth. And we have two distinguished guests for you today. Believe me, you will be truly blessed by them, by both of them. We have one, Miss Diana Bejois was, Senator Diana Bejois. Welcome today, definitely from the Office of Community Relations of LSU now. You know, she's always been involved in health and community health. But we also have uh, Dr. Larry Holier. He is the chancellor of the LSU Health Sciences Center and also the dean of the School of Medicine and, you know, extensive experience all throughout the Mayo Clinic and in New York, Harvard University, Scotland, and we're excited to have him in New Orleans, uh, definitely in a great role. Well, welcome today. We're excited to have you, you both. Happy to be here. Thank you. It's hey, being great. Here, Chris. Great. We're truly excited. And let's, let's, hey, let's open it up and get started right away. And let's talk about this plan. You know, there's a plan to build, you know, a new hospital. Dr. Holier, tell us about this plan. When we start talking about a new hospital, I think the first thing we really need to discuss is why. Okay. Why are we going to build a, a new hospital in New Orleans? Uh, LSU's role is a dual role. It's not only care for the uninsured patients, which is one of our important roles, but we also have the responsibility to train the bulk of the healthcare workforce in this state. Okay. The LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans is actually made up of six schools. The School of Medicine, Nursing, Dentistry, Allied Health, Health, public health, and graduate studies. We have the only dental school in the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And overall, LSU in its health sciences centers train over 70% of the doctors in, that practice in the state of Louisiana mm -hmm. and over 75% of the dentists. So we need to have some place in which to train these kids that are in the healthcare professions. Okay. This is the Louisiana's workforce. Okay. Moreover, if you look at our public hospital system, mm -hmm. where in a lot of our training takes place, okay. um, the uninsured make up a large bit of the patients that we care for right. and that our residents work on as part of their training process. Right. So this is an important system. When we lost the charity hospital system in, in the hospital itself in New Orleans, mm -hmm. uh, we not only lost that, we also lost five other of our teaching hospitals. We lost the VA, right. uh, we lost Baptist, we had, had uh, Lindy Boggs. Mm -hmm. These hospitals were gone. Our residents train in both public and private hospitals. Okay. But the charity hospital has been an important magnet that attracted the young physicians to come and train here in Louisiana. That's an important thing that we've lost right now. You know, physicians, when they just finished their training, they spent four years in undergraduate studies. They spent four years in medical school. They're ready to get out and start taking care of patients on their own. Okay. Well, they, they can't just take care of them on their own. Our faculty supervises everything they do, but still they have their hands on where they're the primary doctor writing the orders on the patients every day under the supervision of the faculty. Right now, we have reopened University Hospital. It's a smaller size than what we had before. But you still need to have a, a medical center that is attractive, that's considered their educational home. And that's what we need in a replacement hospital, an educational home for the training of these kids. Well, the question then begs, if we look at the current system that we have now, wouldn't the new system just expand that out? What would tell? Let us understand the differences between the new system and the new plan, separating uh, the actual system of taking care of the patients from just getting a new building. Well, that brings into discussion the financing of health care in the state. Okay. In the past, the charity hospitals had primarily the uninsured and Medicaid patients. Right. 
Ninety percent of the patients in the charity system have been Medicaid or uninsured. Mm -hmm. That means that you're using state health care dollars to pay for the infrastructure costs of the buildings. Right. The new model is to build an academic medical center that doesn't have just the uninsured, but is, is of adequate size and, and modern facilities, modern design, so that we can actually take in our own faculty's private patients that we're now taking care of in private hospitals. Okay. If you're able to have a hospital that not only has the uninsured and the Medicaid, but also is able to take in third-party payers, uh, pay, patients with third-party payment, insured patients, right. then the, the insurance payments now help fund the infrastructure costs. And by infrastructure costs of a hospital, I mean uh, things like power plant, laundry, right. Uh, information technology, the computer systems, human resources, and so forth. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons that we had the discussion about the, uh, doing a joint hospital with the VA is the VA said after the storm that they had lost 200 beds that they had. They want to rebuild their 200 beds. They thought that was the size that they needed. Right. LSU says, well, we need to rebuild a place to train our kids and take care of our patients. If we do this together uh -huh. in a common facility, okay. Aren't there financial savings and improvements that we can get? And the answer is yes. If the VA patients winds up being 25 to 30 percent of mm -hmm. the beds of this new joint facility, okay. then right off the bat, the third party payer for the VA is the federal government. So you've got 25 to 30 percent of the beds paid for with third party payment, the insurance through the federal government. So the financial model is different now. You don't have the old charity system where you're relying solely on the uninsured dish payments, as it's called, or the Medicaid payments. You now have insured payments. If you have a facility that's large enough to accommodate the needs that we have to bring in and care for the uninsured, but you can also have enough bed and operating room space, ICU space, cath labs, to take in our own faculties private patients, right. then you have a different financial model. The business plan changes dramatically. In the past, where you could never get the insured patients into charity hospital because it was too crowded, inadequate space, inadequate That's, operating that rooms. That's the key reason there. You, you wind up with a new business model that allows funding for the upkeep of the hospital, for retirement of the bond debt. This is not the same old charity model. This is, in essence, another type of private hospital system in conjunction with the VA that is depend dependent upon getting in the payments to cover like any other private hospital would be. When I was in, uh, in New York City before I came here, mm -hmm. I wound up um, being president of the Mount Sinai Hospital. Right. We had a financial issues that occur there as well. We were sitting on the side of Harlem. Mm -hmm. I had 26% Medicaid or uninsured in that hospital. Okay. But we turned it into a financially viable hospital because we did have third party payment of adequate numbers to actually help cover that infrastructure cost. That's what we need to do here. It's not a question of just recreating a building that was the old charity model. This is simply building another modern academic medical center that is financially viable on its own two feet. And, the, and, and literally, the, um, there's no way without a new facility uh, to adopt that current model. And then even touching upon that, the, new, the plan itself seems to be pretty extensive because it also establishes even more so these medical homes around the community, uh, Ms. Bejois. you uh, we, we see them kind of stretched all around the community now. You guys have, have stretched out in the Algiers and, and uptown. Yeah, one of the things, and let me say this, um, it's so important that the community know that medical services are fully operational right now. There okay. seems to be some um, misconception out there in the community that the hospital is not open. The old building building is closed, but the hospital is open and operating full services. We have 230 beds that's that's full to capacity right now. Okay. We have um, 30 mental health beds that we're presently operating um, up at the pole. We also have 20 emergency mental health beds that we're operating at the hospital mm -hmm. in trailers. 
and we also have 20 detox beds. That's the exact amount we had in old charity. Okay. Uh, we also are operating uh, seven primary health clinics that you spoke about throughout the city. That is where we're providing primary care um, to those individuals. Uh, we have um, two on the West Bank. We have one in New Orleans East, one at Jackson Barracks, and uh, we also have two school-based health clinics. And we also work in conjunction with the St. Thomas um, Primary Health Clinic, That's as right. well as the Daughters of Charity. But uh, more than that, uh, we are operating our specialty clinics at Lord and Taylor's. So um, the emergency room is open, the trauma center is open. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the thing I want to emphasize is that there is no lack of health care services right now while we are hopefully um, uh, working on what it's going to take to build a state-of-the-art institution for the future. And I think, um, as Dr. Oli said, we have a very, we have a rare opportunity here to really, to, uh, to you know, we have a renaissance coming on where we can actually bring so many state-of-the-art services together as we build this new facility. But, uh, but I just want to emphasize to the community, though, that, you know, we have ongoing health services going on for the poor and uninsured in this area. It's no lacking of those services. Yes, we can have more of it. We have filled to capacity. And unfortunately, we can't expand the beds right now because we don't have the staff out there. Well, I guess that, that statement of no lack of services, that now that one can be debated in the sense, of course, <laughs> well, that, in the, in that's the a pretty big statement. That, well, there's, there's no lack of desire to deliver those services. Okay. Let me, if I okay. had to rephrase that, okay. I think the desire is there to deliver the best services in, as much as we can with the limited resources that we have as a result of the storm. Certainly, uh, even prior to the storm, there were some limitations on um, staffing of um, nurses and um, other health professionals. Okay. And that's one of the things we also do at um, the LSU Health Science Center. That's one of our responsibilities, that is training those medical personnel. But uh, but certainly, um, if we had more uh, personnel out there, we could open additional beds. And um, hopefully, um, as the as, as it's become available, we can open additional beds. But right now, we all full, and and we all we all we all deliver those services. Well, some what are some of the biggest challenges right now when we're looking at um, because there are a lot of uh, a lot of ideas about you know building a new hospital, but building a smaller hospital. Uh, there are even we understand some that even saying we may need a bigger hospital. So, uh, what are some of the challenges? What are the roadblocks right now to move into this utopian model that we're looking for? Well, again, understanding that the reason um, a given size of the hospital is stated is to make sure that you have a hospital of adequate size so that you can take care of the pent-up demand of care needed for the uninsured patients mm -hmm. and have enough capacity to bring in patients who have insurance. Okay. So that you can have a financially viable model. Mm -hmm. You need to have a hospital that can stand on its own financially and be self-sufficient, not depending upon solely upon state handouts for this. Okay. So the, the roadblock right now is the facility that is available. University Hospital, as Senator Bajwa said, is 234 beds. But the demand is much greater than that. Right. So in order for us to really deliver first-class health care and adequate training, we need a, a hospital of adequate size. The holdup right now is simply the, the development of the process. Uh, the governor has, you, as you know, has agreed, and LSU has agreed with him on a compromise size that we think will work. Okay. Uh, the governor has, and the Department of Health and Hospitals, Secretary Levine, has announced that, uh, in his view, we think that 434 beds of acute care beds with uh, two shelled-in floors would be adequate for us to to build into this and to help prove this financial model. Mm -hmm. So they, we have agreement with the governor and the administration and secretary of health and hospitals on this. Okay. Um, the process now is going through the the, the necessary um, notification process getting feedback from the community that will be affected by this, and Senator Bagwell has been helpful in meeting with them and understanding their concerns, see how we're going to, if we're going to have to use the land that is currently with 
people with housing. We need to find other places for them to live or move their homes or, or compensate them adequately, depending upon the process. So land acquisition is part of the process. The planning is ongoing now. Okay. LSU and, and VA are working together on the hospital planning for this. That's a long process in itself. Okay. Uh, the other issue that is going to be involved in this, of course, is locking down the funding of all of this. Now, okay. the state has come up uh, last year with the, the commitment of $300 million overall uh, from the state, state general funds to help fund this. Okay. Um, we are looking to FEMA for the amount of money that they owe the state for the damage that occurred to the charity hospitals, the Medical Center of Louisiana and New Orleans. Okay. That was big charity and university hospitals. Right. There's some money that is owed to the state for that, mm -hmm. and that would be used for this hospital. Okay. Um, in addition to that, there would be a bond issue that would occur for part of that funding. Okay. Now, the business plan that looked at those f funding sources, the, the money from the state plus FEMA plus the bond issue, would indicate that with the right mix of patients mm -hmm. uh, and a hospital of adequate size to take in the, the right mix of patients, right. that business plan shows that the hospital would be financially viable in year one. Wow. With third party players coming with in third party as a part of the VA. As part of this, the connection. VA plus private patients that we have in there. Okay. And what we would have then is a real different change from the charity model. <laughs> this would not only have enough money to. Re to re um, repair the, the bond debt and uh, pay for that, it would also pay for depreciation of the building, which we've not done before. Uh, the money was not ever used for that. And we would also have the ability to maintain services and build new programs. So it's a process that takes place. I think it's still online. I think we need to make sure that the next major piece that is not locked down is the amount that FEMA is going to pay. There is a disagreement in that. Of about $400 million, I understand. About $400 million. Okay. And uh, I think FEMA said that they thought they only needed to pay $27 million. 20, yeah, That's 20. a big gap between $27 million and $400 or $500 million. <laughs> Sounds like the yeah. people who were standing in line for food stamps. They have a big gap. Yeah, there, FEMA a big was going to repay what we need FEMA to do. has now. an issue with repaying now, money. We've had two separate... Um, studies that have been, actually three separate studies that have been done looking at how much damage is there. Uh, virtually all of the studies say that you're in the 400 plus million dollar range of how much damage is there. Mm -hmm. So FEMA needs to come across with that okay. and let New Orleans get on with rebuilding. This is an important part of the rebirth of New Orleans. Okay. We also recognize that the business community has, has recognized very clearly that for New Orleans, to depend upon the oil industry is not going to happen. Right. That's gone. Okay. Tourism is really not enough of an industry to support the rebirth of New Orleans on a loan. Gambling is not going to do this. The best opportunity that we have today and in the future is building our biomedical infrastructure. When you think about what we have here as an opportunity, you have Tulane University and all of their research activities. You've got LSU Health Sciences Center and all of that. You have the joint LSU-Tulane-Xavier-Louisiana Cancer Research Consortium, a new a cancer center getting ready to be built at the corner of Claiborne and Tulane. Um, we have the new hospital getting ready to be built. We have a new human development center that was under early construction before the storm and needs to come back. We have the new bioinnovation center that is uh, just ready to be uh, constructed and getting ready to be started on that in the next month or so, you know, right there on Canal Street. The biomedical industry is the best opportunity that we have for the city of New Orleans to come back and to build for the future on its finances. You remember in 1999 there was an economic study done that um, the professor of economics at the time, Tim Ryan, who's now chancellor of UNO, did an economic study. And he said that the L L LSU Health Sciences Center economic impact for the city of New Orleans was uh, $1.3 billion a year. This new hospital construction project is scheduled overall with the VA portion in addition, is scheduled at right at around $2 billion in construction. 6,000 construction workers 
in over $1.7 billion a year in economic impact. That is a huge impact for the city for the future. That's what we need. If for whatever reason, for bureaucratic ineptitude, whether it's for political reasons, whether it's for turf battles with private hospitals, if for any reason this hospital is not built here, New Orleans will have missed the greatest opportunity for a rebirth that has ever been seen in our lifetime. That's a major statement, Doctor, but you know, truly um, some very educated people uh, yeah, have looked at other models saying, you know, way off, you know, saying you can, you can rebuild the current charity, but that doesn't create a, a viable model. Uh, you start wondering how can we even look at this current model as being acceptable? You know, uh, we're, I think we talked earlier about some of the issues with the current model where, you know, particularly for the elderly poor that have to, um, you know, a access the current hospital and, and we would call lack of funding, you know, uh, where some of the elderly poor themselves, um, uh, the hospital may not have the certain staffing that's needed, support staff and so forth that's needed, and the funding's not there to support the support staff, obviously because, uh, you know, we're basing our money on state handouts and so forth. You know, what, what, what could we do currently, even now, well, to make a difference? Well, recognize that, that people keep talking about the hospital mm -hmm. as if it's a standalone solution. It's not. Okay. That's only a piece of the health care situation that needs to be addressed. As Senator Bashwell said a moment ago, we've already got seven new clinics opened up around the city. We need to have many more of these. The so-called medical home that we're talking about is something that, that LSU has been doing for a long time. Our chronic disease management is based upon that type of a format. So we're not talking about taking care of all these patients in a hospital. The hospital is only the acute care piece of that care. A very important piece is having appropriate information technology, and by that I mean electronic health records. Uh, the LSU faculty practice has already instituted an electronic he uh, health record using all scripts. So our physicians now have all their patients on the electronic health record. The hospitals themselves, our hospitals, have integrated uh, a system of information technology where if a patient is seen at Charity Hospital in New Orleans and has to leave town and go and be seen at Charity Hospital in Lafayette, Lafayette Charity can pull up their, their CAT scan, their x-rays, their lab work. We have that today. So that's an important part for the future. The part that is really underdeveloped right now, and as we mentioned earlier, this is a part of health care redesign that is underdeveloped across the country. It's the support system that patients need in between care. The primary care physicians in their primary care clinic can take care of the patient on their routine needs and plan their management and plan through pharmacy, as you know, through electronic e-prescribing, can get their pharmacy to, to double check their prescriptions, make sure they don't mix medicines they shouldn't be mixing and so forth. But that's one piece. The hospital, if they have to be admitted for care, for acute care, the hospital system can take care of that. But what you really need is that missing piece. And that is the support system in between where a patient who gets sick at night needs to call in and get connected to this system. That sounds good. Hey, we're excited about, you know, having both of you here. Um, I think it's great subjects. It's great subjects that we really need to touch upon and agree. We have to do something even now, you know, with the current system. We have to uh, have a system where the poor can be happy about knowing that the bunch of the uninsured in one area, whether it's in housing, whether it's in the hospitals or anywhere else, can never be a model, you know, that's successful. And, uh, and uh, we applaud being able to move away from that where, you know, uh, we can all uh, have mixed income, <laughs> hospitals, facilities, and everything. But hey, we're excited to have you both. We just have a few more minutes. We'd like for you to take uh, a few minutes, go right into the camera with our take home message right for our, our viewers. Go ahead, Ms. Bejois. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us. And um, it's so much.
much. It's, um, and Dr. Ole um, certainly is um, is very um, knowledgeable and excited about this um, project. But one of the things that I think I would just want to leave with the community is that this is not new. We were looking at building a new hospital even before the storm. Um, our present facility was not meeting standard. We were having accreditation problems, and so it was already something that was being looked at very seriously. I think we have a very rare opportunity here to bring all of these medical um, complexities together and to really make them intertwine and work well together and to deliver the best best product to our community. And that's what I'm here for as the community um, relations director. I hope people will call upon me um, if it's things we can do in the community. LSU want to be and they are involved in the community, but we want to do even more. So if there's something going on in your community that we can um, help with, uh, providing uh, medical information or even um, some uh, a nurse or somebody for your health care uh, to bring some information, please call us. And you can call me, the medical uh, uh, the community relations director, and my number is 568-5751. And I thank you once again, Chris, for inviting hey, us. excellent. We're excited. Go ahead, Dr. Olier, please. Of course, thank you very much for allowing us to be here and have this discussion. I, you know, following Katrina, you know, we've had tremendous input from all different sectors of the healthcare community and from patients and all. Mm -hmm. and I think everybody has come to a general consensus about what we need to do. We at LSU had actually been working to change the system before Katrina ever started. Many of the changes in healthcare models that we're talking about are things that we have actually instituted before. Expanding the primary care clinics, the specialty chronic disease management clinics. Mm -hmm. We're in this process and we will be in this process going forward. I think it's very important that we all recognize that health care is critical to everyone at all levels of finances. Yes. It's the uninsured and it's the wealthy. They all need health care. We still need our trauma center here in New Orleans. We also need to educate the health care workforce for the future. That is of immense importance to this, importance to this state. And the hospital that people tend to focus on is only one part of this whole model. We do need a new hospital. We need a hospital of adequate size that is financially viable. We need it to care for the patients. We also need it to train the workforce for Louisiana. Well, hey, we're excited, Dr. Holier, to have you and uh, Ms. Bejwad. Definitely honored to have you both uh, here. Hey, I'm Chris Sylvain with Health Issues 2010. Again, we thank you for sharing with us, and please do, hey, take the information. We know it's major issues that's going to affect the patient's community, medical community, business community. But thank you again for sharing with Health Issues 2010. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.